no air, no light. How many of you feel this is an important subject? Vows, commitments? I also felt it was important. <laughs> and that was my motivation behind doing this. How many of you would like to learn to strengthen your vows and commitments? How many wouldn't? So I want to make a disclaimer before I start. This little session I'm doing here today is designed principally around spiritual vows and the things that Prabhupada said about them. And Prabhupada was very, 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 what do I want to say? Heavy. 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 What's the word? Heavy. heavy. He was very heavy. Extremely heavy about this. And how many of you know me? So, those of you who know me, know me I'm not a heavy person. So, if this comes across heavy, it's not me being heavy. It's just me representing what Prabhupada said about this. And we, this is an introduction on vows for a 20-hour virtual course we do. And in the virtual course, we talk about different levels of commitment for those who are not fully committed and what to do when you fall down, and how you deal with it. So you may be thinking in your mind, yes, but... and all the yes, buts are covered in the online course. But here we're going to be a little more focused on spiritual vows. I'm making the assumption that anyone who has come here so far is serious about Krishna consciousness. Otherwise you wouldn't come here and spend money. Now, on my way here, my Sheshika Prabhu told me there's no air in this room. No air in this room combined with the fact that we just ate is a critical problem. <laughs> because in my experience of being a devotee for 37 years, I found that devotees eat too much and sleep too little. And when you combine those two together, it's difficult to stay awake. You agree? Okay, so can everybody stand up? It's time to wake up. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do a little exercise here. What exercise should we do? Should we jump and try to touch the ceiling? Okay, let's jump and try to touch the ceiling, and while we're doing it, we will chant the name Gorunga. And if anyone touches the ceiling, they get a free sweet ball, okay? <laughs> you ready? Gorunga! So, <clears throat> I also have another disclaimer. When I was a Sankirtan devotee, I was never serious. And when I get up in front of people, I feel like I'm on Sankirtan. So I tend not to be as serious as I should be. So, just so you know, I like to have fun when I do my workshop. So, if it's okay, can I tell you just a few things about myself, because you have to listen to me for the next hour. I became a devotee in 1970, and I was calculating the other day, I have actually lived in 16 temples. I actually moved every two years. And we don't have enough seats, do we? Okay. Somebody can help. So, and I've also stayed in another 15 or 16 temples. So I've had a lot of experience within the movement. And this was inspirational for me to develop this seminar. Three things took place over those 37 years that I noticed. And they were, the icing on the cake was once I was sitting, eating a meal with Satyaraj, and Satyaraj said, you know, 
I think we should every year reaffirm our vows. And I said, what a great idea. And then I heard a radio show, they were interviewing a man, and he said, they said, I've heard you've been married 25 times. He said, that's true. He said, every year I have a wedding, and we reaffirm our vows. So I said, that's a great idea. We should reaffirm our vows. Then I began a few years ago studying literature about self-development and how to apply it in Krishna consciousness, because I found it was very beneficial for myself, because it... It dissects processes in such a way that make it easier to follow. So, one of the big things that came out of the self-development literature, if you've ever read any, is the concept of commitment. As opposed to wishing or desiring. And the basic principle that they teach is that it's nice if you want something, or if you think it would be good that you have it, but it's totally different than being committed. It's a totally different world. Completely. Just like, for example, if I said, Prabhu, could you loan me $100,000 and I will try to pay you back? Would anybody do that? Somebody, please, I need 100000 Oh, Prabhu. I'll try to pay you back. This is all possible. So we'll talk to you after class. You know, I'll do my best <laughs> to pay you back. So... If we think about it, a lot of times in our life, we think about our commitments, they're a little bit like that, aren't they? We'll see, we'll see what happens, I'll try. So I studied some books, and one of the things that I saw was, I wanted to study books of the people who were some of the most successful people in the world, because I figured, well, if you want to find out success principles, you might as well find it from the best, and that was what came up. They are committed. 100%. So we're going to talk about that. And of course, the other thing that concerned me was the fact that many of us have a difficult time following vows. How many of you have a difficult time following your vows? How many of you have an easy time following your vows? Okay, so we all agree that it's difficult. One spiritual master was initiating his disciples, and when somebody said, you know, 50% of the people sitting in this initiation are going to go away. He said, yeah, I know, but the problem is I don't know which 50%. <laughs> so. so anyway, I did some experimentation on myself, and I learned some very great lessons. How many of you read that article on Dundavaks that I wrote? or got it in my newsletter. So, I've done a lot of work on myself. Whenever I teach something, I do it first on myself, and it's helped me tremendously. And so I'm very excited about this, because, just like we were talking about the Joppa retreat and how it's essential, Papa wrote a letter to the GBC, and he said, you should go to every temple and make sure they chant 16 rounds and follow the regular principles. So I felt it was essential to give devotees every tool possible to help them follow. Just like I was initiated at the age of 20. It was the first vow I ever took in my life. How many of you, that was the first vow you ever made, your initiation? Especially if you weren't married, probably was. I didn't know what a vow was. And I had a devotee tell me, he said he was having trouble sexually. He went to two counselors. One of them was a priest or a monk. And he said, Okay, we can move forward. So, this devotee was having trouble. He's had, he had trouble ever since he was a dormitory with pornography. He went to a counselor. And, and he told the counselor that he follows some of the senior meeting and so forth. And he said, so who is your mentor? Who is your coach? Where is your support, support group? He said, I don't have one. And the counselor looked at him totally dumbfounded. Basically, his expression was, how can you expect to do that without a support system? So, my effort in establishing this course was to develop a support system. I feel it's like we've been dropped in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You say, we don't know how to swim. You say, good luck, Prabhu. I hope you make it. And I have a list of all the devotees who didn't. And you see the bets. So that was my motivation behind it. And in the work I did, it was very exciting. 
One of the things I found out about commitment was that I was not 100% committed to many of the things that I should be. And one of the things I realized was if I'm not 100% committed, what does that mean? Am I going to tell others to commit? That's true. And also for me personally, it means what are my chances of following through on something? The less to the degree I'm not committed. Just like Papa gives the example, if you make a determination to fast on a fast day, then what happens after that? Once you make that determination, is it easier? What's easier? To fast on a fast day where you make a determination, I'm going to do it, or you say, you get up and you think, I'll think about it. What's easier? You make the determination. So there's a principle, a very interesting principle. And I just have to go through my notes and make a confession. What the Barnatom said, are you ready to do this course? And I said, not as ready as if I were being paid to do it. So, So what the reality is... You get $100,000 out of it, do you? Yeah, that's true. That's true. But I didn't know that before. <laughs> so, here's the principle. Principle. Mm -hmm. Which principle? How do you push it? This principle can change everything. The Indians might the Indians might understand this, you have to translate it for me. Can you see that in the back? Should I read it to you? How do you push it? It says ninety-nine percent a bitch, one hundred percent a breeze. So for all the non Americans or those who do any Indians know what that means? <laughs> Who would like to explain? Do you have any time? Can you explain? A bitch is something very hard. Exactly. So let's say you, you're you doing some work and it's very, very difficult. Like, you know, you're writing some computer software and there's all kinds of glitches and then you go, how's it going? You go, it's a bitch. you experience that? Any computer software programmers, there's a new word, American word, is your vocabulary. When you go back to work on Monday, you can, after a few hours of working, you go, this is a pitch. <laughs> and now look at you. Uh, so, what does this mean? If I commit 100%, what happens? What happens to the question about whether I'm going to do it or not? Is gone. The bridge is burned behind me. If I leave one percent doubt, what does that mean? I get up in the morning and I think, am I going to do it? Or am I not going to do it? Is this a simple principle? How many people in the world do you think get up in the morning thinking, whether I'm going to do this commit or not, one hundred percent? Practically everybody, except the people who are successful. They can get one hundred percent. Who else wants to loan me a hundred thousand dollars? I'll try to pay you back. I'll think about it. See what we can do. What if on your wedding day, right before you gave your bride the ring, she said, uh, "I'm ninety-six percent committed." <laughs> what if your surgeon said, "I'm ninety-eight percent committed"? What if the pilot said, this is your pilot, I'm 76% committed. That's probably all you are committed to anything you do. What would you think? So this is a principle that can do amazing things for you. So what I would like you to do right now is write down all the things you're committed to and next to it, write down what percent you're committed to. 
And if you don't want to do it, do it anyway. <laughs> My, the classes I give are, are you have to, if you don't do the work, you're not going to get anything out of it. So if anyone doesn't have a piece of paper, you can submit your own. Paper, pen, anybody? Write down the things you're committed to and what percent you are committed to them. There's more papers to move? Oh, here's a piece. Can we get that piece to the back? Write down what you are committed to. Let me write on the board. Are you committed to chanting a certain number of rounds? You're committed to go to the temple a certain number of days. You're committed to your wife, your husband, your kids. You're committed to your job. You're committed to reading. You're, whatever, you're committed to going to school. You're committed to a certain career. Whatever you're committed to, write it down and write to what degree you're committed. I'm supposed to play music when we do this. Now you're going to get to hear something you've never heard before. By this wonderful devotee. Say, you know his name? Yes. Yes. How did you like this? I did have a fire on this song, I'm not sure. There's two other questions I want you to answer. If you're not at 100%, why? And how you can get it to 100%? What do you have to do? And then do you find that helpful? Okay. There's a lot in between the space between the 100% and where you are. There's a lot going on there. So we need to discover more of that because that's we want to close the gap. You know there's a saying, how you do anything is how you do everything. Have you ever heard that? So, sometimes you might say, well, it's okay not to be committed in one thing, and I'll be committed in another. But generally, it's pretty much, it tends to be how you're going to be committed in one thing. It's, a, it's an overall way of looking, an overall way of doing things. So my experience is, Commitment in little things will make, make commitment in bigger things. Have any of you experienced that? Does that make sense? Yes or yes? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to write that on the board. It's so hot in here, I think we're going to have to exercise quite a lot. Anybody getting tired? Yes. 
How are you doing anything is how you do what? Thank you. So, should we stand up again? Am I okay? Who wants to stand Who needs to stand up? Stand up. Okay. Just pretend you're in Zimbabwe. So, I need everyone to choose a partner. So, the person next to you, find the person next to you. This is, don't go in groups of three, go in groups of two. And um, just figure out now who's going to be your partner. And so, who doesn't have a partner? Okay, hey, Mataji? Mataji, you have a, okay, you don't have a partner. Okay, who else doesn't have a partner? You two can somehow ever get together? Is that possible? Logistically? Raise your hand if you don't have a partner and then meet together. Look around and meet. Not a G, she, she needs a partner. You two, if you can meet. Okay. So who's going to be partner A? Raise your hand. Okay. Partner A, you're not going first. Partner B, partner B is going first. So partner B, sorry. So this is what you're going to do, partner B. You're going to start, and I want you to talk about the space between where you're at and 100%. What it is, why it's there, what you can do about it, how it makes you feel how it's affecting your life. Anything you want to talk about in that space? If, you, if you're a touchy-feely, just talk about how it makes you feel, how it would make you feel if you were 100% if you're not there. If you are there, how it makes you feel being there. If you're an achievement-type person, how are you going to get there? Uh, or if you're an introspective person, why you're not there. Anything you want to talk about that space between where you are and where you want to be, talk about it and I'll give you a few, like three or four minutes, and then I'll ask you to change and it'll be partners A. A, a, a partners A. Partner A's turn. Thank you. So, partner B, you begin. striving to be in the mode of goodness. If they're sincere, how can they still fall down? Prabhupada. If they're sincere, how can they fall down? They're not sincere, therefore they fall down. Now how many of you who have ever fallen down have thought you're not sincere after you fell down? Or did you think, Krishna knows you Krishna knows I'm spiritually weak. I don't have to raise your hand because it will be all of us. And we're all too embarrassed to say that. And it's very difficult to confront to say I'm not sincere. It's a hard thing to say. Mother Jesus Swami was telling us once that sincerity must be combined with strength. Spiritual strength. Yes, yeah, spiritual strength means sincerity. Sincerity means spiritual strength. If you promise before the deity, before the spiritual master, that I shall observe the rules and regulations, and if I don't follow, then where is my sincerity? But the devotees are trying to be in the mode of goodness. Prophet will try. This is the big one. Will try. Then why do you take initiation and promise? You are trying. First of all, you be fixed up. Why do you cheat Krishna, the spiritual master of the fire? If you are not fixed up, you should not take initiation. So then, Prabhupada really gets into this point. When you promise, and now you're trying. 
there's not a hundred percent commitment. So he's questioning that. And there's another one of the most amazing things I want to read. Two more. Stay with me. Gets better. Is everyone still awake? Yes. Yes. What does it sound like? Everybody still awake? Yeah. So, this is really good. Should I read it? Yes. Next time? Yes. 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 No, no. <laughs> Sometimes this weakness seems to be proper interrupts. Weakness? Then you should rectify weakness. Why you should give any importance to weakness? Weakness is weakness. Rectify it. You know, one of the principles, one of the most important principles that I have ever learned in order to achieve anything you want is do not focus on why you can't do it. Just focus on how you can do it. Isn't that what Prophet's saying here? The Lord is trying to make an excuse. Have you ever made excuses? Do excuses um, color your vision? Do they? The reason I can't follow is because I'm spiritually weak. And that spiritual weakness comes in the form of being blue. So I feel very blue right now. Because I'm spiritually weak and I can't follow. Anyone else have an excuse? I have to wear the glasses with you. Who's got a better excuse than that? Is that like a really good one? Come on. Who's got a good one? Who's got a really good one? Yes? Afraid of failure. That's a good one. There's a lot to be said about that. Every master was first a disaster. You can't, there's nobody, the most successful person in the world, they didn't start out on top. They, they say, you have to fail, and you have to fail soon. The sooner you fail, the better, because you'll learn. There's, there's a cartoon, this guy comes in with his resume, and it's all the things he's done wrong. He's never been to school. Because this is my resume. It's all the things I've learned and all the things I've done wrong. Who else has it? Jamil has a good excuse. I had a bad childhood. <laughs> I had a bad childhood. Yeah. You're blaming on something. So this is all the jaded vision. Right? Take a picture of that. For the people back home in Orlando. <laughs> so, there's one more thing I'd like to read. And when I first read this, um, this caught me off guard. I think this is even better than the last one. Are you ready? Yes! yes. If you take the online course, you get all this on your computer. So if you ask me for it now, you need to take the course. And pay your dues. Okay. I'm right, sorry. The process is to follow some rules and regulations, but they say, how do you get the strength to follow the rules and regulations? Same question. I'm too tired to exercise. How do I get the strength to exercise? Oh, I have the answer. Just go to sleep. We got all kinds of energy, right? Okay? Is that the solution? How do I get the strength to exercise? Uh, to follow, not by asking. What does Papa say? Let me read this again. The process is to follow some rules and regulations, but they say, how do you get the strength to follow the rules and regulations? And Prophet says, that is not your business. <laughs> that is very heavy. What did Prophet say? That is not your business. Can I read that again? <laughs> Should I act it out more? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Should I say what they were <laughs> the process is to follow some rules and regulations, but they say, how do you get the strength to follow the rules and regulations? That is not your business. That is Krishna's business. Is that heavy? It is not your business to get the determination. What is your business? It's to follow your promise. You follow your promise, what happens? Vows and power. Krishna gives you the strength. Is that an amazing quote? Yes? Doesn't sound like it's amazing. Is that amazing? Yes! yes! Okay, everybody get up. Everybody turn to uh, your partner, give them a high five and say, that's an amazing quote.
Okay. <laughs> Are we having fun yet? I'm trying to make this very depressing subject fun. As it goes. So, um, I would like to tell a story. Two stories about commitment. And one story is about a man in Mauritius. Anyone from Mauritius here who has ever been there? My old man, I made him a devotee. And he made me a devotee, helping me make me a devotee. So, his name is Mr. Tilak. Can everybody do this? Mr. Tilak? You have to do this. Mr. Tilak. And the reason you have to do Mr. Tilak is because I want you to remember this story every time you put on your... Tilak. Every time you say Tilak, please go. Tilak. You, this is a wonderful story. If you, every time you put on Tilak, if you remember this, it will help you a lot. So, I was in Mauritius speaking with Mr. Tilak, and it probably was 1992. So, Mr. Tilak was the man who hosted Prabhupada. If you look at the pictures of Prabhupada in Mauritius, you'll see a man there. He hosted Prabhupada. He was a government ministry. He made all arrangements. What's his name? You can put your hand on your forehead and say that. Mr. What? Tila. Piyush. Mr. What? Tila. Some of you are sleeping. I can't see you in the back, but <laughs> if you're sleeping. So, anyway, Mr. Tila took care of Papa. They were very close. He did everything that happened in the Russia, he took care of him. So, we were talking one day, and we were... Reiterating all the stupid things we ever did in Mauritius. Because every time we did something stupid, we would call Mr. Who? Tila. And Mr. Who? Tila. Would get us out of trouble. What's his name? <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> I tell you, it's, it's going to, it's worth it. It's going to, because you're going to remember Mr. Tila. <laughs> it's going to be worth it. So, so, go through this whole list of things and how he bailed us out every time. We messed up this way, someone overstayed their visa, they had it, he had it extended, they couldn't get an airplane, he got them an airplane, they got caught by the police for doing this, he got them out of jail. One thing after another, he was expressing his complete frustration that we were a bunch of baboons. <laughs> Basically, you guys, he would just say, you guys are just a bunch of idiots. And we're like, I know. We know that. That's why we need you to bail us out. <laughs> so, the other thing is that Mr. Tilak gave away the farm and he gave the land and his wife didn't know he gave it because she wouldn't let us give it. So he was very devoted to Prabhupada. She didn't know that he put it in as well. So in British law, you have to get the wife to sign the land over. So he put it sign it over, so he put it in as well. So he could sign it over in as well without his wife's signature. So, he was a very devoted man and Prabhupada asked him to help us. So after, but now he's also Ayur Samajas, and Ayur Samajas don't believe in the deity. Correct? So it was kind of awkward for him to be helping us because he really didn't believe that Krishna was a person. So, but, but, but Prabhupada asked him, so he's doing it. So he really did all, all these stupid things. What kind of stupid things going on in Russia? I'll tell you. I said, Prabhu, could you trim the hedges? And, and, and Tulsi goes wild in Russia. So what hedges did he trim? Tulsi. One day he uh, took the car and drove it into a store. <laughs> he said, Prabhu, that's it. You cannot drive it again. So he got the keys and drove it into a telephone pole in the second round. That's, that's just how that happened on the first day I was there. And then the second day, so anyway... I mean, you know, that's, what we're, that's a day in the life of the Russians. You know, it's just, that's what it's like there. So we, we would do stupid things, he would bail us out, and he said, you have done so many stupid things, horrible things, I don't know why I continue to help you. And then he stood back and he said, but your Prabhupada asked me, and that's why. So that's commitment. And therefore Prabhupada said, you gave your word. You honor your word. That's a committed person. Those are values people have. If we don't honor our word, what are we doing? Counselor, psychologist, what do we do when we don't honor our word? Who are we devaluing? Ourselves. 
You tell somebody something and you don't take it seriously. Does that, what does that mean? You're not taking yourself seriously and you're not taking that person seriously. The other story, Bhakti Tata Swami story. Who knows it? And I'll carry on shot right now so I tell the story. But um, I have it written here. I have to find it. Because as I said, I wasn't being paid to do this. So I'm not totally together. But I think this, this is told by Rana Swami. Giri Swami is telling it as Rana Swami told it. But the Tirtha Swami's body was in so much pain from cancer that he could hardly remain in one position for more than an hour without having to be moved. He could hardly sleep. The pain was so great that if he did happen to fall asleep, he would inevitably wake up. Yet sometimes the devotees would find him deliberately staying awake, even in the middle of the night. When they asked him why, he replied, I have to finish my rounds. Radha Swami appealed to him, Maharaj, you've already done, you've done enough. Now you're sick. You can hardly sleep. You don't have to finish your rounds. Krishna will understand. But Bhakti Chaita Maharaj answered, No, I must finish my rounds. It is my promise to Srila Prabhupada. From the day of my initiation, I have never failed to chant 20 rounds. It is my service to Prabhupada. I must finish my work. That's wonderful. So, when we talk about commitment, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about Mr. T. Rock, we're talking about people like Dr. Chaita Swami, and we're talking about Srila Prabhupada who said, I thank you all very much for accepting me as your spiritual master, and I promise that I will take you back home, back to God. That is Prabhupada's promise. Prabhupada said, when you take initiation, it is a contract. He took it as a contract. He took it that seriously. So, that was the first point. The other point I want to make is that vows are relational. Commitments are relational. I'll ask you a question, couple questions to make this point. <clears throat> Bring to mind a time when someone made an agreement with you. They followed through on the agreement. No, no, excuse me. Bring to mind a time when someone made an agreement with you, broke that agreement, and afterwards you saw that person. How did you feel? How did you feel? Upset. Upset? Betrayed. Betrayed. Distant. 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 From that person. From the person. Disappointed. They must have had a need why they didn't show up. Oh, she's the empathic. They had a need why they didn't show up. You're not supposed to say that. It threw off my whole presentation. <laughs> so generally, everyone in the room except. Um, the pure devotees, like the great empathic persons like Vajalila, uh, will try to understand the position. Of course, that's a good answer. We should try to. But generally, our immediate reaction is to feel some, something negative. And then, for most of us, we can process it later. Think of a time when someone made a commitment to you and kept it afterwards, and you saw the person. How did you feel? Thankful, Thankful happy. Think an example of a time when you made an agreement with someone and you broke it and afterwards you saw that from face to face. How did you feel? Guilty, sorry, shameful. Shameful. You call an instance when you make a commitment to someone and fulfill it. How did that feel? Good. So we can see how commitments develop into relationships. Now, there's a formula here that I want you to look at. It's a very interesting formula that relates to this. And I think you can all relate to it. And I have to just find it. Sorry. I've almost found it. I didn't find it. 
Anyway, here's the formula. You know this formula. Okay. You make an agreement. No, you break an agreement. This is a, a mathematical equation here. So everyone who's not good at math might get this, but try your best. You break breaking an agreement, breaking an agreement plus a good what? Good what? Excuse. Excuse or story <coughs> equals keeping agreement. Breaking an agreement plus a good story equals keeping the agreement. So I thought I was late because I banged my top and the door was coming in and I had to get banded. So I thought I, I know I told you I would show up at 4, but I call it out of gas. So in other words, what we're doing is we're justifying it with a good story. But you have to realize, or we all need to realize, or I need to realize, we all need to realize that from a person's point of view, still the agreement was broken and it hurts the relationship. Because most of these stories are really not that good. Are they? Now if you have a good story, like somebody was dying on the side of the road, and I had to stop and help them, okay. But generally, in the psyche, if we think a good story is okay, if I didn't follow it, and it equals the same thing, it's not. So this is a very important formula. It's a relational formula. You have to at least understand it's hurting a relationship. Now, could you write down three or four things that you promised people you would do that you haven't done yet on a piece of paper that you should have already done? And next to it, write the story or the reason you haven't done it. Thomas, is that erasable? Oh yeah, that's okay. You erase them off your piece of paper. Um, this is just an exercise to see how easily we tell people we'll do things and forget. Especially when you owe people money. <laughs> and then you forget how much money you owe people. They never forget. We don't forget if you owe us money. So, what I would like you to do now is write down anything on a piece, anything on a piece of paper that you would like to reaffirm your commitment to, or something you have not committed as much that you would like to commit more to, or something you're not at all committed to that you would like to commit to. Any commitments you're not 100% committed to, or commit to something you know. And are you finding that difficult to do? 99% is a bitch, 100% is a breeze. If we're 99%, it's going to be hard. Compare it to 100%. I want you to save these for now. We're going to bring these up. You know, as, we, as I'm talking, you can write them. We're going to bring them up in a little bit. And I'll go off another principle, which is, has proven very valuable to me. Well, let me go back to this relational idea. Those of you who got my newsletter heard a story that I wrote, that I made up. It's a fictitious story. And I would like to relate it to you because it was very powerful for me. I envision going back to the spiritual world and meeting Krishna. And I got to the gates and they tell me to wait at the gates. How many of you have heard the story? Okay, so not all of you. And then I saw Krishna in the distance for the first time after time of memorial coming towards me. And I was told he wants to push me greet me. And my heart is pounding, my body is shaking, I'm crying, I'm thinking I finally made it, there's my Lord. I can't get over what's happening, this is it. 
That's a very emotional experience for me, and I see this beautiful form, and it's, I, I can't take it. It's amazing. And Krishna comes up and he looks at me, and he's about to speak, and he's looking at me in a very, in a way which makes me feel there's something he's concerned about. And I'm thinking, what is he going to tell me? Is he going to tell what he told Lord Kumar? It's been so long since I've seen it. You've suffered so much. I'm so happy to see it. I'm going in my mind, what is he going to tell me? How much he loves me? How much he misses me? And he smiles, he looks at me in the eye and he says, I don't know if I can trust you. And that's it. You're devastated. You're finished. So that meditation has been very powerful for me. And often I think, when I'm challenged in my own commitments and vows, I, this thought comes, can Krishna trust me? If Krishna appeared to me right now, would he say, I'm not sure if I can trust you? Can Krishna trust us with the whole world? Can we handle it? The money, the power, the wealth? Will we still be committed to our vows if I had one zillion dollars in the bank? And 10 million followers, can he trust us? Can Krishna trust him? There's a very power, it's been a very powerful meditation for me. Prabhupada said Krishna can give you the whole world. So when I am challenged in my vows, I like to think, Krishna, I want to show you, you can trust me. Because I don't think there could be anything more devastating that could ever happen to me than Krishna telling me. I'm not sure if I can trust you. So I just offer that. that that's a personal... It's just something I have done personally that I found very, very powerful. To tighten the weak links. Maybe I'm at 99% but that link is still weak. If any of you make jewelry, if you have a space, space and a link, the jewelry falls apart. You have to tighten it completely. So that's been a powerful meditation for me. Another powerful meditation. How many of you are here are initiated? And we do an exercise for you, you other devotees. You can, if you want to get initiated, you can imagine this happening to you. Please close your eyes. Find some music here. sitting at your initiation ceremony. Try to imagine who is there, sitting to the right of you, sitting to the left of you. If your spiritual master is there, visualize his face, his body. If you can remember what you were wearing, what the room smelled like, what it looked like, what the deities were wearing. What was being said. And remember what you were thinking. Remember what you were feeling. Now visualize you going up to your spiritual master and reciting the four regulative principles, promising I will not eat any meat for sure, no illicit sex, no intoxication, and no gambling. Now I imagine, once I imagine, remember. You're getting your beads from your spiritual master, or whoever gave the beads. And you're practicing to chant 16 lines a day. Connect with those feelings. Connect with that determination you are making. With that resolve, with that intention. Promising to do this for life, every day, 365 days a year. Till I die, I've committed.
Please uh, open your eyes. Uh, I offer you that meditation as a gift to all of you who have been initiated. <laughs> if you are ever challenged in your vows, in addition to thinking, Krishna, can you trust me? Can you can't trust me? Connect with the vows you made, connect with the mood you are in, connect with the promises you made. Connect with the resolve and intention you had at that time. And connect that with your word of honor. And the things that God have said that you promised, you said you would do it. And focus on how that inter- uh, relates with all your activities, not just your spiritual vows. Hare Krishna. Uh, before we get the devotees to share their realizations about the commitments that we have written down, what did we all write before this? Do you do this? I'd like to tell you a little bit about the online course we're going to be doing. That's okay. So we have some sheets, sign up sheets. Can you pass those out? And while he's passing out these sign-up sheets, the sign-up sheets are an opportunity for you if you want to take this course. It's a virtual course, so you can take it anywhere in America from your home. And in addition, I have a monthly newsletter. And in the newsletter, we deal with topics like vows, commitment, forgiveness, humility, envy. Where are they? I think they're on the back table. Yeah, I think they're on the back table. So you can also also, um, sign up for the newsletter. And... I also teach some other courses, which you, if you take the seminar room A, uh, coming up after this, uh, we'll tell you more about. But I want you to hear about the online course. So, we discussed basically two points today. And the two points we discussed are vows are empowering, and vows are relational. And bring us a relationship. So, there are many other aspects to commitment. I, I don't expect that all of you are going to come out of this seminar being 100% committed to everything because it's, a, it's an ongoing process. But I wanted to tell you what else we covered in this virtual class. This virtual class means that I, as your teacher, will be there live with you on the internet. It's not that you'll never see me, I'll be there. One and a half hours a week, I'll be there, and there'll be another three and a half hours of work and exercises like we're doing here that we'll do on our own. And the nice thing is that a lot of you who are in this room, you've had a chance to meet one another, so you're going to meet one another virtually, you're going to be in the same classroom, so you can create a bond. So, um, we are going to talk about commitments to ourselves. We find that most people find it easier to commit to others than to who? To ourselves. Isn't it? So we're going to talk about that, how to become more committed to ourselves. Um, then we're going to talk about another big one. The big one is the guilt we feel when we don't keep our vows. If we take initiation and we make vows, there's a very good chance at some point we're not going to keep them. Something's going to happen. Statistically speaking, we would probably venture to say most of us slip and fall at some point. And then what do we have to do? We have to process the guilt. We have to process the failure. And if we don't know how to process, what happens? It gets worse. We want to follow those more. We feel more guilty. We follow them less. So it's a very important subject to deal with. Because it's something that practically we're all going to face at some point. I didn't. I committed and I didn't do it. As your business group says, when you fall, you become a divided person. You've made a commitment, the society is telling you what to do, and you're somewhere else. It's kind of like a spiritual psychosis. And it's very important to deal with that. Um, we also deal with the concept of once you fall, how you can learn, learn from your fall now and get up and become even better off. For some people, when they fall, that's it. But actually, you can learn so much from it and you can become stronger from it. We talk about um, uncovering our beliefs. 
Like some of you may have felt that you don't follow vows and commitments because you don't believe you can follow them. But where do those beliefs come from? You can change those beliefs. Those beliefs are maybe the very thing that are causing you not to follow. And by changing them, everything can change. So we talk about beliefs. Um, we talk about uh, success principles it's the, that are tied with our beliefs. That, well, I don't think I can do that much. I'm not that great. I can't mean that much. You know that uh, there's a principle, when you're challenged to make a commitment, what happens? You grow. Isn't it? Is everybody still away? Yeah. When we make a challenging commitment, do we grow? Yeah. Yes. We do grow. So we talk about the importance, say, oh, that's too hard, I can't do it. Now turn it around and say, you need to do that, because that's what you're, what's going to cause you to grow. Um, and then... Uh, a very wonderful thing we talk about is successful strategies for handling broken agreements. Usually, when you break an agreement, you think, if I just say, I'm sorry, it's okay. Say you're sorry, as the first thing, is the absolute worst thing you can do. Well, because a person thinks, oh, you said, I'm sorry, you're going to do it again. And half the time you say, I'm sorry, it's just about looking good. If I broke an agreement, if I say, I'm sorry, you look looking good. There are three other things to do before you say, I'm sorry. And there's one other thing you do after you say, I'm sorry. And we discuss those. You want to know what they are? Yeah. Would that be important for you? Yeah. Sign up for the class. <laughs> sorry, I'm a salesperson. But it works. How do you actually get back to a level of commitment that you want to achieve but is not yet possible? It's about you know, Kaizen where you take small steps, and maybe you want to get to this level, you're here, you can't just go back. There's a way to do it. In the seminar on vows, I had to always commit. I said, do you read Prabhupada's books every day? They said, no. I said, would you commit? They said, no. I said, will you commit to one sentence a day? They said, yes. So now I read Prabhupada's books every day, 365 days a year, one sentence at a time. So you can commit to little things. Sometimes you think, oh, I can't do it, it's too big. Commit to small steps. I'm not at 16 rounds of fall, but I think I'm going to do four. Um, how, lack of, uh, how lack of belief in yourself, not in ability to commit, maybe why you don't follow the I can't principle. And then we also talk about this managed decision daily. Some of you have any commitments here to be more committed, but you have to do this every day. You have to manage that decision daily. It doesn't work that you just did it here. Right? Because we're having the best inspiration. Woohoo! I'm fired up, commitment, yeah, two times, and then what happens? Go back home. Get the TV and that's it. So, you have to manage that inspiration. How often do you manage it? Daily. Okay, is everybody awake? How often? Daily. Okay, okay. so you have to manage it daily. So, another thing I would like to offer you is if you think this would be important, this seminar, uh, for anybody that you know, then outside on the table there, we have a sign, more sign-up sheets. So you can, you can bring that back to your temple with the web address. You can also, if you'd like to purchase this course for your friends, you can sign up here. Okay, how much does this course cost? It costs $175. It's 20 hours. For everyone at the Festival of Inspiration, it's only going to be 135 And... That means anytime you sign up here for the course, you can take the sheets with you, you can sign up now. And um, if you sign up, I will personally offer you a gift. I produced six CDs, tapes in my day, plus about many, many other songs. I will offer all of them to you as downloads. You will get the address and you'll get free download of every song. I have a is that is that good? That means, so, so that's just a little... Well, for you. If you had to buy that CD, that'd be $90 right there. Of course, the way you don't pay $15 for CDs, they get it from their friends for nothing, right? <laughs> that's why Mahatma is so rich. It's for getting all those CDs. <laughs> for this couple of years, you give me $100,000, so it's going to pay for So, okay. So, I will offer you, when you sign up, you're going to get a web address, you're going to get a link where you can make all the songs. And I have, did you like this song? This is unreleased. Yes. 
submitted herself unreleased. Stuff. I have all kinds. English, Sanskrit, everything. So, that's another impetus for you. So, it's 135, and uh, it's a wonderful course. We go from A to Z about balance. The expected result is that you will be much, much more fixed in your commitments, a more committed person. A lot of problems you have in following the, the principles will be resolved. You'll be a person that more uh, reliable to your word. You'll be better to the people around you. So, I hope you enjoyed the seminar. I want to thank you all for coming. And we hope to see you. Uh, we're doing a Oh yeah, we're doing another one of each another seminar. What you're doing? Okay. We do other courses besides that. We do forgiveness, we do Japa retreats, we do prayer, and we have so many other courses in the works. Wealth building. Who's interested in the wealth building? We're going to do a course. Wealth building. Yeah. Not the point town. He lost all his money. He's really interested in that. <laughs> so, uh, how to make money, how to grow it, how to spend it, sexual purity. Is that an important topic? And um, envy, jealousy, humility, all these things. We're going to do. We're going to tell you about this company we've developed called Out About Life. And uh, if you go to room A, what's that? The title is. This is a Zen title. What's the title? Fully beyond flickering devotion and isolation. Can you figure out what that means? No, you have to come and find out what it means. Mahabharas Kuntaya will be presenting, Rajavila will be presenting, Pusha Sutta Didyabha. So, take these sheets, um, if you fill them out now, you can, if you fill out the sheets now, you can bring them up here, or you can keep them with you and bring them to the table. Thank you very much, Sutta Bhavad Ki Jai. Bring back your, these folders you were writing on. Thank you very much. Please keep showing these folders, we need them for them. Please. Green Hall in the Lounge, Room A.